Um, and for our first speaker tonight, um, uh, Mr. Janice Onya, he is a PhD candidate in health psychology and psychiatry uh, psychologist and a specialist in pharmacology research. Uh, he holds a master's degree in central nervous system sciences and a master's degree in pharmacology as well. He did his master's thesis in uh, Santa Cruz y Saint Paul Hospital, Barcelona, Spain, uh, where he worked on phase one clinical trials involving the acute administration of psychoactive drugs, as well as experimental drugs for the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases. He is currently developing scientific research at ICIRS and in Medical Anthropology Research Center uh, in Spain as well, focusing on the relationship between psychedelic drugs and health. And uh, today, Mr. Ona is going to be talking to us about the potential safety, benefits, and influence of the placebo effect in microdosing psychedelic drugs. I'm very excited to be here. And MAPS is, has been always a, a, an inspiration for us. Um, yeah, and of course, it is a pleasure to share with, with you our research. In this case, uh, I will present the main findings, uh, as Leo said, uh, from a systematic review that we performed about microdosing. Uh, this, this review was uh, actually written during the first strict uh, lockdown in, in Spain in March, April. Uh, the activity in, in the ICRS office was interrupted, of course, and well, the scientific director, Jose Carlos Bozo, thought that it would be great to have something to do from home, you know, and we realized that the, well, the ideal option was a systematic review. So, so well, uh, as you know, this well, this is the paper that we published uh, some some weeks ago. The thing of microdosing was first mentioned by Albert Hoffman uh, in the 1970s in, in an interview. He didn't specify much about that, but then a book written by uh, James Fadiman spread the word, and and actually in the review we suggest that the trend of microdosing started more or less after the publication of, of that book. Uh, since then, as you know, uh, lots of media articles started to talk about microdosing. Uh, and actually, well, histories about workers in Silicon Valley or families taking tiny amounts of LSD for breakfast are certainly kind of juicy, you know, and they were published in so many websites. But from a scientific point of view, the truth is we have so many unanswered questions, you know, for example, regarding the safety, the benefits uh, or the potential influence or the placebo effect when microdosing, which were the three main points that we analyzed in, in the review. Well, about the methods, uh, very quickly, just uh, we use these databases. We found studies published in the last three years. So all of them are quite, quite new. Most of them consisted in observational studies, but we had also four randomized and controlled clinical trials. Some observational studies had large samples, so the total sample of, of all the studies collected was around 3,500 people. And it should be noted that there was a majority of males in, in the sample, so it's important to take into account this in, in future studies. And most of them assessed microdosing practices, we mainly were using LSD or psilocybin uh, mushrooms. Other substances were, were also reported, for example, one PLSD or mescaline or ayahuasca, but they were not so, so common. I will briefly discuss the results, since I think that you might be quite familiar with the results that are usually found. And I'm actually more interested in going to the final part of the discussion, where I will present some controversial points. Well, th these are the benefits and, and the adverse events reported. Uh, let me just note that for nearly every benefit we have, its opposite is reported as an adverse event. So this is very difficult to interpret and it is very rare in, in pharmacology. Uh, because, I don't know, when you prescribe a pain reliever, you don't expect that this pain reliever causes pain <laughs> sometimes, you know. Uh, well, but there were so many non-controlled variables and we don't know the exact doses or, or their purity in the case of, of population surveys, but still it's, it's quite strange. 
Regarding the placebo effect, it has been claimed for by some that in the benefits of microdosing, there should be a placebo effect to some extent, you know. And this can be only assessed in placebo controlled conditions. So this is what these clinical trials found in, in the review. Bershot and colleagues found that 6.5 6.5 micrograms of LSD did not increase the, the ratings for field drug scale in the drug effects questionnaire, but both 13 and 26 micrograms did. So uh, you can see how there's a kind of cutoff point here. And in another, in another study, they asked participants to guess which kind of substance were given. And while nearly all of them correctly identified the placebo, as you can see, 16 out of 20, uh, the, the other, when, when they were given LSD, only eight identified, uh, identified the LSD as a placebo. You know? So they clearly noticed some kind of effect. These effects, however, were not defined as a hallucinogenic or psychedelic, since most of participants uh, thought that it was a sedative or a cannabinoid or a stimulant and so on. And actually, only one participant identified the substance as a hallucinogen. And this last study, uh, despite not having found any psychoactive effect uh, with, with these doses, uh, 5, 10, and 20 micrograms, there were some changes in the temporal reproduction task. Um, so under the LSD condition. So this is suggesting that even in the absence of any subjective or clear effect, microdoses are altering some, well, to some extent, the, the time perception. You know? So let's move to the beef. <laughs> Um, the discussion. First, we have this thing of observational studies uh, and clinical trials. And if we are asked about uh, what would we prefer in terms of robustness or the reliability of, of data, I'm sure that most of us would choose, of course, clinical trials. But the thing is that apart from the fact that the clinical trials are placebo controlled, they don't have much more reasons for being preferable uh, in some cases. As we can see, the samples used in, in these observational studies are much larger than not only these clinical trials, but in general, phase one and phase two clinical trials. So these samples uh, were quite limited. And the context in which the experiments are run uh, are a naturalistic setting in the case of observational studies with the presence of many other confounding variables, of course, that can affect the results. But these variables are um, real life variables, you know, that we will find these kind of variables in the majority of, of subjects. Uh, whereas in the clinical trials, the context is highly controlled in a, in a lab setting. And this is far from, from these real life conditions. And moreover, and this is the, well, this is crucial, I think, the clinical trials that um, have been published by the groups of Perchat, participants having suffered in the past some adverse reaction associated with psychedelics, just bad trips and so on, were excluded from the study. So the results are clearly biased in terms of safety. And Additionally, and I don't understand that, <laughs> uh, the researchers allowed participants to smoke and drink coffee before and after the experimental sessions, which, well, if you are assessing some subtle effects, uh, such as mm, the ones produced by macrodosing, the nicotine or caffeine would interfere to some extent with these effects. So, I don't know. Mm, these clinical trials have these limitations, and I think that it should be noted. And well, another thing that in future studies should be studied more in depth is the relevance of the psychological experience in, in the therapeutic benefits of psychedelic drugs. Uh, one of the main benefits reported by microdosers was this mood enhancement, which is in accordance with the effects of regular doses of psychedelics. But in this latter case, in regular doses, we can see a lot of literature 
uh, suggesting associations between, for example, intensity or quality of the psychedelic experience, peak experiences, or the appearance of mystical type experiences, among others, and the benefits obtained. But the use of microdoses and their benefits is suggesting that maybe these psychological aspects are not as relevant as, as previously we thought, you know, which could be a good thing actually, because uh, maybe not all the patients want to enter in these profoundly altered states of consciousness when looking for some relief of their distress, you know. So, well, let's, let's see. An interesting result that uh, was that some subjects in three different studies informed about a reduction or complete interruption of their use of psychiatric, psychiatric medication. Um, well, this is a very good uh, outcome or a very relevant finding. I'm sure that uh, you are quite aware about the current crisis in psychiatry, where most of the treatments don't work. And if not, well, we wrote a little piece about that in an online journal, nothing important, but you will see the main points described there. Uh, so, well, there is a remarkable need for, for new treatments. And the thing that people was able to reduce their medication with microdosing is, is encouraging, since at least they will be free from, from the serious adverse events associated with, with psychiatric uh, medication. Another interesting result was that a lot of people informed about uh, reduction in the use of some drugs, such as caffeine, alcohol, cannabis, and tobacco. So this is suggesting that microdosing should be tested for, for dependence disorders as well. And now I would like to go deeper in the safety concerns, since a remarkable number of subjects reported some kind of adverse event. These were the, the most commonly mentioned. Um, most of the studies didn't provide percentages uh, regarding the proportion of participants who reported these adverse, event, these adverse effects. But the ones who did, they ranged between 6 and 20%, more or less. Some of these adverse events might be explained by, by overdosing, since sometimes it's difficult to, to calculate the exact amount of micrograms of LSD, for example but other reasons should be explored as well. And another important point is that this high frequency of adverse events in microdosing contrasts with the one found in the studies using regular doses of psychedelic drugs, you know. In nearly all of them, we can see how the adverse events were minimum, some headache, some min minimum uh, adverse events, things like that. So how how could it be possible, right, that with microdoses we have more adverse events than with regular doses? And the thing is that the clinical trials uh, that have used regular doses have the same limitations that we mentioned before. Some of them recruited patients with previous experience with psychedelic drugs, of course, but also excluding those who had some kind of adverse reaction in the past. So as you can see, Paradoxically, even with these highly different dosages, uh, microdosing could provide clues about potential adverse events caused by regular doses of psychedelic drugs that have been overlooked in, in clinical trials. And well, just uh, some suggestions that we made in the paper about future studies. First of all, the methods uh, of both observational controlled studies can be improved. In the case of observational studies, it would be necessary to reduce the gender bias, of course, but also prospective studies are necessary. And regarding clinical trials, the issue of the sample is highly problematic, so the best approach would be to recruit naive participants, either with microdoses or with regular doses, and see what happens with, with them, right? In, in one of the papers included in the review, the authors suggested that Obviously, people that have had experiences with regular doses, they will interpret their microdosing practice as highly positive, just because it reminds 
those profound previous experiences with with regular doses, right? Other substances should be explored, of course. In the case of ibogaine for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, um, it's a good, it's a very illustrative example. But and this is particularly interesting, also in the case of non-psychedelic drugs. You know, uh, there is a case report that we cite in in the paper, informing about a successful case of treating heroin dependence with microdoses of suboxone. You know, so treat. So we might be witnessing a whole new paradigm in, in pharmacology, maybe, because some medicines, maybe they work in microdoses and, and we can avoid their, their adverse events. No? Another thing is the protocols uh, used in the studies collected. The most commonly used protocol was the one by Fadiman, but also there were a lot of uh, other procedures. So it would be great also to standardize this and, and apply the same, the same scheme to the studies. And lastly, I have to say that, unfortunately, <laughs> despite uh, being necessary, I think, just for organizing the information, our review was published outdated, since during the process of revision and peer review, five other papers were published. And well, we, we couldn't include them, and we didn't revise them in depth but they provide highly valuable information. As you can see, pharmacokinetic data, an increase of PDNF after microdosing, which is fascinating and suggests that even with uh, the, the supposed placebo effect, microdoses are working to some extent, you know, biologically. Or uh, regarding the analgesic effect as well, which is also a uh, highly interesting indication, the, the treatment of pain with, with psychedelics. So, well, if you wanted to, to, to be updated about microdosing, I would suggest you to, to read our review, of course, but to take a look to, to these papers as well. And that's all. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. That was a really, really great presentation. Uh, we're going to dive right into the questions just so we have lots of time. Um, so the first one here, um, how long does it take on average for psychological side effects to manifest? And does that differ from more physiological side effects like temperature regulation? Hmm. Well, there were um, a lot of diverging reports in, in the studies. Some of them reported that after using some other drugs, just like uh, cannabis or alcohol, they experienced some adverse events. So this is an issue that I, I didn't mention, but this is very important to take a look into drug-drug interactions, you know, even with these very tiny amounts would be maybe some kind of interaction. And in other cases, uh, some, such as the anxiety increase or this thing of mood, uh, mood, uh, mood enhancement, no, the opposite, <laughs> sorry for my English, but <laughs> this, this case of worsening symptoms, you know, uh, appeared just instantly, just after the intake of, of this microdosis, you know. So there will be a lot of, um, a lot of situations in which these adverse events appear instantly or after several days or weeks or with mixing other substances. I don't know. I'm not sure if, if there was another question. With... Um, uh, he's just asking, and how does that differ from the more uh, physiological side effects like temperature regulation? Oh yeah, yeah. We, well, unfortunately we cannot, uh, we cannot extract some conclusion about that because this, these reports were, um, were reported in, in observational studies where no further tests were, were, were carried out. So unfortunately we, have, we don't have this information. Thank you so much. Uh, next question here from Thomas Anderson um, saying, uh, sorry, maybe I missed it, but what was the source indicating that there were more adverse events with microdoses versus higher doses? Yeah, good question. <laughs> this is not exactly uh, true <laughs> because it is difficult to, to calculate the, the number of adverse events in, in the clinical trials. 
I think that um, some systematic reviews and meta-analysis have been published in, in the last months about that. And it could be possible to check the exact number. But even so, some authors state that in the clinical trials, the adverse events were underreported, you know, because the psychedelic therapist consider some, some effects, just like anxiety or panic attacks or this thing, just as part of the process, you know, so maybe they don't report the, the adverse event. So, well, a percentage of 20% of adverse events, it, it, it could be reasonably more, more, more higher than, than the clinical trials. But yeah, um, it, it was not an exact number. <laughs> I promise to check that in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Our next question from Leo. Um, what is the recommended microdosing regimen? Do most people follow a one time every three day protocol? Yeah, this one was the most commonly used uh, to take microdose, wait three days and then another time and so on. But um, I don't know, the, this is the most well-known protocol, but I, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't know if this is the best uh, approach because uh, as, I, as I said, there were other procedures not only this by Fadiman and these uh, clinical trials that followed other procedures, but also in observational studies, you cannot actually mm, be sure about the protocol used. So this would be part of the uh, next of the future studies, uh, assessing microdosing to check if some protocol may work better than other. But yeah, it's, it's very difficult to, to say some, something for sure because we are lacking a lot of information. Thank you. Uh, next question from Candice. Uh, where is the state of the evidence around microdosing for Parkinson's disease? You mentioned Ibogaine, but what about LSD or psilocybin? Hmm. Well, we don't have evidence, unfortunately, about LSD or psilocybin. Uh, a clinical trial that, that I presented administered um, these microdoses of LSD to older people, but healthy people, not in people with some neurodegenerative diseases. And the case of ibogaine is, well, we have preclinical evidence with mice and we have some case reports informing about some improvements of Parkinson's symptoms. But it is nearly the same scenario. We don't have um, data with, with people with these diseases. We have this hypothesis. We, we know um, why they might be working, but it, this is uh, another, um, well, we, we, we are lacking exact information about that in, in patients. Thank you. Uh, next question from Maria. Um, she says, we are familiar with how the placebo effect works. However, how do we understand the process and those who thought they were given the placebo but actually took LSD? Would that be um, the so-called uh, non-sebo effect, essentially individuals who are negatively biased? Mm -hmm. Just say uh, something. Could you, re could you repeat the question, please? Because um, there, were, there were different points and... Yeah, so really just wondering um, about the process um, of those who thought they were given the placebo but actually took LSD. Was there anybody who thought they were given the placebo but actually were given LSD and what did that look like? Oh yeah, yeah, there were a couple of studies about that and it depends on the dose. Uh, as I stated, the minimum, well the lowest dose of LSD were not different with, with placebo. Patients didn't notice that they were given LSD. This was the case of six micrograms of LSD, I think. But then uh, from 13 to 15 and 20 micrograms, they noticed something. It is difficult to, to, the, to identify the substance because in, in one of the trials that I presented, they did not inform subjects about the kind of drug that they will administer and only one participant identified these microdoses with a hallucinogenic drug 
but well, we we have this uh, clue, this this uh, information about maybe thirteen micrograms of LSD would be the cutoff point to notice some some effect. And about the you you mentioned the nocebo effect, maybe. Mm, yeah. Because yeah, this is so so interesting, because in the case of LSD or other drugs, with uh, an important stigma maybe there's also a nocebo effect and this nocebo effect could be related as well with with this with the adverse events reported you know so this is very important not all not only placebo but also nocebo very interesting our next question from michael here is there any research or future research on the impact of microdosing on driving performance on drug and performance sorry Driving performance. Oh, driving performance. Um, no, I didn't see anything about that, but it is um, very interesting because if people are microdosing and you can, well, one one of the studies, uh, as you as you can see, patients had some time perception alteration. So, yeah, this is a pretty good. Very interesting proposal. <laughs> Very interesting. Next yeah. question from Alex. Um, and he's wondering how might microdosing with DMT look like? Do you have any idea? It's very interesting as well because, well, DMT have a lot of interesting properties in inflammation and neuroprotection and uh, plasticity promotion effects. But um, since it's metabolized rapidly by mao, by monominoxidas, you know, uh, that is in the digestive tract and in the, in the kidney and in the peri, in the periphery, peripheral system disease. Uh, I don't know if, if microdoses of DMT would be absorbed, um, but maybe they can exert some kind of effect in, in, this, in this metabolism, you know? I don't know, it is something that we don't know. And I thought actually that maybe microdosing other substances like salvinorin or this rapid, this fast acting psychedelics, um, well, I don't know, they have interesting properties, but they are, they are producing so, um, excessively intense psychoactive effects, you know, for the clinical practice. So maybe microdosing would be another option for them, but I don't know. Thank you. Next question here from Alexander. Uh, any thought or opinion on the use of psilocybin to treat dementia? Hmm. Well, this is a, a, an indication that is being studied. There is a remarkable need for, for the treatment of dementia, Alzheimer, and Parkinson. I mentioned not only the psychiatric um, disorders, but um, neurodegenerative ones are also very, well, we don't know, we don't have any effective drug for them. So yeah, the treatment of dementia, uh, we have only these studies uh, administering LSD to, to healthy older patients. I told you healthy older uh, participants, but we don't have uh, this, this information. Uh, maybe they could work or they could not. We don't know. I, I'm sorry for not, <laughs> for not no, okay. reaching some conclusions, but. <laughs> no, I think people really just want to pick your brain to see if you are aware of any literature even. Um, yeah, maybe but we are, we, are, we are expecting this kind of studies, but this takes, takes time, you know. Definitely. Um, and is there anything talking about, have you heard of any chatter or future studies talking about microdosing during childbirth? During childbirth, wow. <laughs> we are providing a lot of ideas for, for future <laughs> studies. Uh, no, 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 I'm not aware about that. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of people is, is doing it, but, but there is no report about that. All right, uh, and I'm gonna take uh, the last question here. 
Um, and this person is asking, or they say, uh, I think you mentioned a lower psychiatric medication during or after the microdosing, which implies yeah. participants were taking psychiatric drugs while microdosing. I've also read that it can be potentially dangerous to combine the two as many psychiatric medicines impact serotonin. Mm -hmm. Just wondering what your thoughts on people microdosing or already taking psychiatrics um, is and how that uh, may have impacted safety and adverse effects. Yeah, of course, we, we would not recommend for anyone taking these psychiatric medications to start using microdoses just because this thing of potential interactions that have been reported as well. But um, yeah, this, this protocol of reducing the, the psychiatric medication is something that happened. I, I think that because the people just decided to try that and, and they noticed that they can reduce their medication, but in a supervised setting would be advisable to taper off first the, the psychiatric medications and then in safety conditions administer the, the microdoses. Perfect. Well, we're going to wrap it up there, but thank you so much, um, Janice. Uh, it was really great that you could share all your wisdom with us. And I know our audience really, really enjoyed uh, hearing both your presentation and your answers to all their questions. Uh, thank I'll you to you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much.